This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service, Nebula. Hey, welcome to the 100th episode of The Friday Checkout. Nice. This week, Apple announced a ton of new things at WWDC, Xiaomi got into even more trouble, and the EU had a legislative triumph. Welcome to The Friday Checkout. Okay, we have a ton of big releases this week, starting with the ZTE Axon 40 Ultra that just went live with really good flagship specs and an impressively well-hidden selfie camera under the display. I've played around with it for a little bit and the selfies look pretty poor, kind of as expected, but otherwise this is a surprisingly solid looking phone. Next up, Microsoft announced bringing the Xbox game streaming app to Samsung's 2022 TVs from the 30th of June with 1080p streaming and even a PlayStation DualSense controller support, where early previews claim that it's almost good enough to replace consoles. Not bad. Microsoft seems to think that the Xbox can be everywhere. It's free real estate. Then Dell also updated its 13-inch XPS line with new 12th generation Intel chips and a new 2-in-1 that now looks a lot like a Surface or maybe an iPad. And also this week, LG updated their Gramma laptops with the usual spec bumps and notably also with something called LG Glance via Mira metrics, which can do things like A, automatically locking your laptop when you walk away from it, and B, blurring the display when your computer notices that somebody else is looking at your screen from behind you, and C, even moving your your cursor to whatever screen you're looking at, which sounds either great or terrible depending on the implementation. Then in a non-release this week, Meta apparently gave up on its rumored smartwatch, which was not only supposed to have dual cameras, but also a feature for translating nerve signals from the wrist into digital commands, aka electromyography, which is apparently a feature that we might see in other devices coming later. And finally, we also had Apple dropping a ton of new announcements at WWDC as well. There is a new MacBook Air, which comes not only with a new black color, a notch and MagSafe charging, but also the new M2 chip, and that chip has also made it to a new 13-inch MacBook Pro as well. Apple's lineup, in my opinion, is now really strangely confusing because there are two laptops that cost basically the same but do different things, and last generation's M1 Air is still on the market as well. Oh well. Okay, my first story of the week is going to be all the other news that I found really interesting at Apple's WWDC conference. Starting off, it's fascinating to see just how much Apple is really doubling down on finance as they're now starting to offer a buy now, pay later service as well, just like Affirm, Klarna, and the rest. And this time, instead of outsourcing the finance stuff to someone like Goldman Sachs, like they did with their Apple card, Apple is actually going to do the whole service itself, including credit checks, potential late fees, etc. Combine that with their Apple card and the fact that you can now accept credit card payments directly on iPhones, and Apple sure seems to be moving more and more into the direction of becoming a bank now. Then on the software front, we're getting iOS 16 and iPad OS 16, which bring a lot of good quality of life improvements like clock screen customization and the ability to better use external displays on iPads, though nothing truly game changing. And the M2 chips this year also felt a lot more like a solid yearly iteration rather than a major jump as well, with 18 and 25% jumps on the CPU and GPU respectively. Effectively. The chip can now also handle 24 gigabytes of unified memory with higher bandwidth too, which is nice, but it is still using TSMC's 5 nanometer process, even if it is a slightly upgraded one this time. The real promising news though is that the mass manufacturing of the M2 Pro chips have already been started too, which in turn should come on TSMC's new 3 nanometer node, meaning hopefully a much bigger jump. And fun fact, Qualcomm also came out with a pretty bold statement this week when and their CEO said in an interview that Qualcomm, via its Nubia chips coming late next year, are, quote, aiming to have the performance leadership in PC on the CPU, period. That's a straight promise that they plan to beat the likes of Apple, AMD, and Intel on the CPU front, at least in PCs, which would be pretty extreme, but we'll have to wait and see whether they can actually deliver. Okay, and my second story of the week is going to be Xiaomi getting into even more trouble, though this time not from India, but rather their home country. So Xiaomi is well known for not just making products themselves, like their phones or their sub-brands like Poco and Redmi, but also for acting as an investor and strategic partner to their ecosystem brands like Roborock, Yeelight, etc., with the company having invested in more than 400 companies worth 8.8 .8 billion. 
billion. And this week we have learned that a bunch of those companies are having problems with Chinese regulators, which has caused them to pause their plans for IPOs. Those include smart mattresses maker 8H, intelligent lighting company Yeelight, and commercial operating system maker Shanghai Sunmi Technology, which have all shelved IPO plans in recent months. And specifically, some of these companies have reported withdrawing their plans after regulators asked them questions like, please clarify to what extent Xiaomi interfaces in and controls the company's technology, procurement, production, supply, and sales, which suggests that the regulator might be worried about antitrust issues. And if that is the case, it could seriously hurt Xiaomi's ecosystem strategy, where they try to run hundreds of brands as a loosely connected group. From Xiaomi's point of view, it said that it didn't understand and that, quote, apart from having investments from Xiaomi and launching some products, they developed their business independently. Now, Xiaomi is not unique in their strategy of investing into many, many different adjacent businesses and many other Chinese companies like Realme, Alibaba, Tencent, and so on. They all kind of do it and they're all to some degree in some level of trouble. But Xiaomi is in a really weird position because their other businesses are not doing great either. Of course, I've talked about the massive crackdowns that the company is facing in countries like India before. And new counterpoint data also suggests that after very briefly toppling the market with their phones last year, their market market share has fallen significantly and has remained much lower since. About this time last year, Xiaomi was riding high, but the trend that it had been building has been wiped out, and so the problems are kind of piling up. Okay, and my third story of the week is going to be three pretty major tech regulation stories coming out of the EU. And yes, just only covering the EU and their tech regulation could probably be a new show all on its own. Anyway, the first one is the European Union's highest court deciding that Apple can no longer keep its trademark, Think Different, because Apple hadn't been using the slogan in any meaningful way for about a decade. Now, trademarks have to be used actively for a company to actually keep them, and watchmaker Swatch originally sued in 2016 to have Apple's unused trademark annulled so it could use Tick Different in its marketing material instead. Okay. Second, the proposed EU ruling that would phase out new internal combustion engine cars by 2035 just passed another big vote, meaning that it continues and now just has to go through negotiations with member states. And third is that the USB Type-C mandate from the EU is now fully official and will become mandatory by autumn 2024. This means USB-C on small and medium electronics, USB power delivery as a shared fast charging standard across the EU, and an option for consumers to buy any device without a charger if they want. Now, there are a lot of really nerdy details about the exact technical implementation, about which companies will be impacted by this and how, and whether or not this will kind of stifle innovation in the EU and across the world that are a little bit out of the scope for this video, but we have made a full 20 plus minute deep dive video with friends of the channel TLDR News that you can watch over on Nebula as an exclusive. I've linked the video down in the description where we cover all of the little details, and this video joins many other Nebula bonus segments that I've done in the past, as well as a whole Nebula original series from me called Technorama. Nebula is a platform that we, the creators, have built for ourselves, and it includes not just my videos, but also those from TLDR News, Nothing But Tech, who is a new addition to Nebula, Real Engineering, and many others, so without ads, of course. Getting a subscription brings you plenty of bonus content from us and helps us finance creating even more and better content without having to worry about the fickle YouTube algorithm, monetization, and so on. And the best way to get access is through our bundle deal that we have with CuriosityStream for just 15 bucks for a full year for both streaming services. CuriosityStream, if you don't know them yet, is the home of high-quality online documentaries from the likes of Jane Goodall, David Attenborough, and more. And on there, you'll find plenty of hidden gems like Engineering the Future, showing futuristic tech projects that I think you will really like. Check out the bundle at the link in the description and get access to both services, and I'll see you in the next video.